Hi, this is City Showcase. My name is Bernard Avle. Today we have a great guest, the founder of Ashesi University, the admirable and legendary Patrick Ewa. He's joining us to talk about some new developments with his school and his reflections on education. Stay tuned. Where is Ashesi in the scheme of things, in the plan you had many years ago? Where has Ashesi got into? We are right on track with where we, where we thought we would be uh, in terms of numbers of students, in terms of the academic programs. Mm -hmm. I think that we're ahead of where I thought we would be in terms of how quickly we've built a very strong uh, culture at the institution <coughs> and how quickly we've been able to prove ourselves. Mm. So it's doing well, but there's still definitely room for improvement. If, if there's lots of room for improvement and there's lots of room for growth. Mm. So, you know, we, we're executing our second 10-year plan mm -hmm. and I'll be, I'll be heading that effort. For uh, the 10-year plan? So you've, you've done your first 10 years? We've done our first 10 years. We're four years into our second 10 years. So you're 14 um, years old? We're 14 years old. Wow. And uh, there'll be a future president of the university that'll do the rest. Amazing. So you do 20 years <laughs> and leave the rest for them. I see. We are 12 years old here. What have been some of the key milestones in the 14 years? Look, I still remember the first day uh, a parent walked in and paid the fees, handed the check. Uh, that was a major milestone. <laughs> When somebody <laughs> actually put their when money I, into Somebody this. actually paid for it, right? Wow. And I wanted to frame that check, but, but we needed the money, so we, so we cashed it. <laughs> um, wow. There's, there's been lots of milestones. You know, um, our student honor code was a major, major milestone. Moving, moving to our own campus was a major milestone. Uh, and um, starting an engineering program was a major milestone. I think this new scholarship program uh, that we're announcing today is a major milestone for a chassis. Mm. So let's talk about the MasterCard scholarship and the foundation and the relationship. What is this whole thing about? Well, uh, w in, in 2010, uh, we uh, first made contact with the MasterCard Foundation and they were really very intrigued by a phenomenon that had happened at Ashesi when our students started the Nana system. And it was at a time when the foundation was, had decided that their strategic focus was going to be supporting education in Africa, but especially supporting education that was about educating the future leaders of Africa and paying a lot of attention to ethics and, and so on. Uh, and so they had started a scholarship program and the first uh, nine institutions uh, that were accepting students paid for by the MasterCard Foundation were all in North America. Uh, then they saw a chassis and said, hey, there's, there's excellence in Africa too. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had a conversation with them about uh, supporting our scholarship program, which they did. Uh, and that has gone well. Uh, we've enrolled 200 students so far, paid for by the MasterCard Foundation, mm -hmm. and they just renewed the scholarship uh, program. So we've sort of signed on a second grant agreement with the foundation mm -hmm. to educate another 240 students. Mm -hmm. And these are students from all over the continent, not just Ghana. Wow. How important is this in the scheme of things? Uh, you've said to me before that you already have a scholarship program you do and X percentage of students get some financial aid. Right. So it's not as if you've been, charged, you've been without some sort of help for students. So how significant is the kind of help they're giving now? It is a major, major shift for us. So when we started uh, in 2002, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, but we decided to give scholarships to half of our students. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, I personally was getting advice saying, look, Patrick, this is not such a good idea. 
you should just only admit paying students and then when you're financially stable and secure then you can start offering scholarships but we decided that the little we had we would start sharing um, and it was very very difficult I mean Shesse had moments when it was very financially precarious um, but we kept at it what the MasterCard Foundation scholarship has done is that it's really enabled us to do a lot more so uh, for the first time uh, in 2011 when we first started with the MasterCard Foundation um, we were able to give scholarships that covered tuition room and board so uh, students who couldn't afford even afford to feed themselves we could support mm -hmm. Uh, we were able to give free laptops to uh, some of these students. And so th what the MasterCard Foundation Scholarship Program has done is it's greatly expanded our ability to support the poorest of the poor, um, but who are very capable mm. and give them access to the HSE education. So do you know how many students would benefit? It's going to be 240 students. Wow, uh, 240 students? Yes, and you know the, the, the program we're announcing today actually covers more than just scholarships. It's also going to fund some programs where we are going to be uh, reaching out to other MasterCard scholars at KNUST, at CAMFED. Uh, it's it's $25.5 million to be dispersed over an eight year period. Um, it's going to help us recruit actively across the continent, so it's going to fund the recruiting exercise in different countries. So to almost make Ashesi the center of MasterCard's programs in the continent, in a sense. In, in a way, uh, you know, I hesitate to use the word center. Uh, Ashesi was the first uh, institution in Africa that they supported, but one of the things that's happened also is that it's shown the MasterCard Foundation that they can support other universities and in fact after the Ashesi grant uh, I think a couple years later they signed on KNUSD as well mm -hmm. so what we think this represents is that yes Ashesi is sort of the first and there's a lot of focus around Ashesi but it's really going to expand beyond Ashesi and that a lot of other African universities will eventually be signed on to the MasterCard Scholarship Program as well. Just give me a, an idea of how, how much does it cost to train a proper student? So, okay, generic. So if, if you, you want to give me a world-class undergraduate university education in, say, a liberal arts environment, forget about government and all the things they say, uh, pre uh, free pain or whatever, whatever. If you really want to train a student, pound for pound globally, to be like a top-notch student, how much would it cost to train that person? So that's a difficult question to answer, but I'll, I will try. Um, so you say global standards. Let's look at, say, a Swarthmore or a Harvard. How much does it cost? What does it cost those institutions per student to do what they do? The cost is somewhere between ninety dollars to $100,000 a year per student. Wow. Now, because those institutions have big endowments, they're able to subsidize that uh, education, and so the price that they charge is about $60,000 uh, for the, for the quote-unquote full-pay students. And then they have scholarships, so there's some people that pay nothing and people that pay uh, sort of a range between zero and $60,000 a year. Wow. Now, no, so... I, I use those numbers because you look at that standard of education, you look at the, the, the lab equipment that they have, the strength of the faculty, the kind of research that they do and all of that. It is a very um, expensive enterprise. Now, we are operating in a different context, right? So it is, it is not feasible for us to be trying to do an education at the cost factor of you know hundred thousand dollars per student right which is sort of the top universities in the world what those cost um, but I, I think that here in Ghana um, if you're going to do um, 
you know, the kinds of student-faculty ratios and so on, that um, tuition would range between uh, five and ten thousand dollars equivalent a year, and then you add onto that room and board. We would be able to operate at a level where the output of our institutions will be comparable to the output of a Harvard. So, so you are you are able to do more with less. That's right, because we're we're in a different environment. The you know the salary scales are different. Um, so here the labor cost is less is lower than say North America. Um, the capital costs are not necessarily less. I mean, getting an internet connection here is more expensive than in the United States. Um, electricity is just as expensive or more expensive. So, but. But if you sort of consider all of those things, I'd say that between five thousand, twelve thousand, fifteen thousand dollars a year, you would be able to put out the uh, similar output to institutions that cost a lot more. But but globally, how are universities dealing with this challenge of having to train people in a better way? Because the challenges of the world have become broader and larger. We have more students who need to get into universities and it appears everywhere in the world university fees have become a problem. South Africa students are protesting. A lot of people are supporting Bernie Sanders because he wanted to abolish some sort of university school fees. How, how should we think about educating university students, even in the public sector, and how do we manage the costs? Because I remember in my, my days in the university there was something they called cost sharing and now they have introduced something they call full fee paying. So two people can get, somebody can get a good degree, but if it's not fee paying, he won't get into medical school. But somebody can get a worse, uh, what do you call it, result, but because they can pay. What, how, do you, how should we resolve these problems of getting quality? We don't have the money. Is it free? Should we? What, what's the best you think well, about this? Well, I think <coughs> the, two, the two models in the world that I see that are working really well. So first, you look at the Scandinavian countries. Right now, in in a lot of the Scandinavian countries, education is free from you know kindergarten through university. Mm. Taxes are very high. Taxes are fifty percent um, on average, and government is very clean. There is very little corruption, mm -hmm. and the public money that everybody pays through their taxes, in a way, it's sort of treated as prepayment for a set of services that the, that the state provides. Mm -hmm. um, and those services include education, health, infrastructure, etc. And if you're charging 50%, then the wealthier people are ending up paying more into the bucket, but everybody gets the same uh, level. And, and that model works, but it, it depends on uh, close to zero corruption, it depends on a, a public service that really um, manages uh, government money, public money in a very efficient way. Um, the second model that, you know, I think that if you look at university education, the United States probably has the strongest university system in the world. Um, you can't say that for their high school system for, uh, or their primary school system, but their university system is incredibly strong. And the model there is that they have a graduate, you know, they, they sort of, you know, the private universities there and all the top, most of the top universities there are private. So Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, all those guys are private. Um, and the model there is they focus first on what does it take to provide a certain level of quality and they price it. And then the people who can afford it pay for it. The people who can't afford, they subsidize. And then they give everybody such a great education that they go off and become incredibly successful. And then those people donate back to the institution and build these vast endowments. So, you know, Harvard's endowment is over $30 billion. $30 billion? Yes. That's just, you know, wow. money in investments, and they take the, the earnings from those investments to support wow. poor students who can't afford. And so, there are students who go to Harvard who pay less 
than students going to University of Ghana, right? Because they're subsidized. And that model works as well. But if you take that model, you have to, um, you have to really focus on execution. Mm -hmm. The third thing is that we've got to think about the difference between undergraduate education and postgraduate uh, doctoral education. In the United States, um, as well as in Europe and, and Asia, a lot of research is funded by the government, mm -hmm. right? So they have institutions that are very well funded that university professors and PhD students can apply to for research funding. Okay. And that comes out of, you know, public money. Um, and people get awarded those grants on a competitive basis, whether it's public or private university. Um, Ghana hasn't really done that. A lot of African countries haven't done that. But we, but we still want our faculty to do research. Mm. You know, today in Ghana, there's a lot of talk about research. Uh, the accreditation board pushes everyone to do research. But there's no government funding for research. So the way you're going to fund that research is using tuition fees from undergraduate students. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, so that makes the tuition for the undergraduate student higher. Mm -hmm. And so if we really want to do quality, you've got to get government-funded research for the, for the graduate programs and the, and the doctoral and postdoctoral programs and faculty research. Mm -hmm. You've got to, and then you've, you have to make a decision are you going to use public money to subsidize or are you going to have a scale of people who can afford mm -hmm. should pay and people who can afford to be subsidized? And I think for Ghana, what we ought to do in higher ed is the latter, which is that people who can afford to pay should be asked to pay. Those who can't pay should be subsidized. And the reason for that is government has other tasks to do. They have to build a lot more high schools. Mm -hmm. They have to build a lot more primary schools. They need to focus on quality there as well. And so their ability to engage with the university system has constraints that we must recognize. Mm -hmm.